working. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. It's um, I'm in Tucson too at the moment, and oh. um, it's been really nice this week. So it's nice to go out and not be fried to death. <laughs> oh, definitely awesome. That's great because mm-hmm. you're based pretty much up in um in Phoenix right now. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So I go to school at ASU. Um, okay. But uh, my boyfriend uh, lives down here in Tucson. So since the whole confinement, well, lockdown uh, and online classes, I've been here, which is so much nicer. I get it. I get it. No, that's great. I'm glad you're here. You're going to have to come by. Stop by the home stretch. I yeah. Think. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. it's. Um, I've heard so much about it that I would love to come by and, and see it. Um, that makes me happy to hear if you've heard good things <laughs> oh yeah definitely only good things <laughs> well the whole concept is amazing uh well i wish hi hello. yeah so this is tim We're, we'll be chatting hello. together <laughs> nice to meet and, you nice to meet you too and you live in tucson then That's, yep. yeah okay awesome. i go to the u of a yep oh very cool very cool yay <laughs> yep. yeah um is it six yet? Or I mean, um, I guess it doesn't. I think it's yep six yeah, o'clock six. right now. Okay, so if uh, everybody's ready, I think we can <laughs> yeah. start. Well, uh, thanks uh, for joining us. First of all, it's uh, uh, it's an honor. <laughs> I, I, it honestly is. I've um, to uh, I read a bit more about you uh, just before this, and I was amazed by everything you had done. I didn't know it was. Um, possible to do that much in <laughs> that's <laughs> that's good because, thank you but you know it's um that's just stuff on paper you know <laughs> <laughs> well so. it says a lot anyway. well it's funny because we were joking before this and I was like I was like reading a bit about you and your website and stuff and I was like I was like wow I, I, I guess she's probably older and then I looked at your picture I was like oh my god she's like <laughs> she's like really <laughs> young as it's like the resume of someone that seems like maybe yeah. <laughs> like 70. Yeah it, well yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah I just turned 45 the other day and it to me it seems like it's been a you know blink of an eye mm-hmm. um since all this stuff kind of started so <laughs> I'm flies and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like I was your respective age, like just yesterday. So <laughs> well, <laughs> that's an old thing to say. <laughs> well, I suppose that's a, a good sign if your life is um, full of great things and it goes by fast. <laughs> yeah, there definitely have been bumps and bruises along the way for sure. But I think in the big picture, which I'm definitely able to grasp a lot more now. Um, yeah, you know, the I'm, I feel like the journey has been worth it, you know, mm-hmm. no matter struggles so yeah that's that's the only way to look at it otherwise it can be too overwhelming sometimes and you know you just want to throw your hands up and be like ah I give up on yeah no never give up (laughs) no never give up (laughs) um so yeah so we're doing this conversation series with Abra uh so the Arizona Bike Racing Association uh, as a way to keep the community like, involved and um, keep everybody together. Um, so uh, we've had other guests on, we've had uh, Nicola Cranmer, some uh, bike racers like uh, Cameron Beard, Magalie Rochette and Ashton Lambie. So we try to get, um, we're trying to have a conversation with uh, lots of different parts of the cycling community. So I think you embody many of many different parts of the cycling <laughs> community, actually. But um, yeah, thank, thank you for being well, on. Thank you for doing what you're doing. It's so important. And especially now when we need to stay connected with people. Mm-hmm. And if we have that opportunity to do this with these live chats, I think it's awesome. So thanks for being part of the solution. Yeah. Pandemic of loneliness and being mm-hmm. sick from other human beings like it's really important what you're doing yeah awesome. well thank you yeah thanks um so maybe we'll start with uh would you mind introducing yourself and um 
well, just saying, uh, we won't have time to talk about everything you do, but <laughs> you've done. I wouldn't want to all that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hi, hello, my name is Catherine Bertin. Um, I am a resident in Tucson. I have now lived in Tucson for half of my life. So I think that qualifies me as a local. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from New York originally, and I came out here for grad school. I thought I would be out here for two years, and it's been um, 22. <laughs> so, you know, the desert is beautiful. It's awesome. And I, I like to start with that history because I really believe that being here in Tucson is what led to this path of, of everything, with cycling, with activism, mm -hmm. with all of that. And so I'm very um, thankful for the Tucson community, which I consider my family. So uh, the short story, I came out here for grad school in writing. Um, I knew I wanted to go in, down the track of journalism and I got my master's out here. And um, what I didn't expect was that I would get involved with triathlon. Um, and I fell in love with the sport. It was awesome. It was great. And I pursued that for well, a good solid nine years. And during that journey, um, you know, and this all started at the uh, U of A Tri-Cats. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. And, you know, as I progressed, I thought I might have a chance at turning uh, professional and making it to the pro ranks. And I did, uh, I was able to get up there and I raced for three years professionally. But I also noticed during that collective nine year journey in triathlon, um, I noticed that I was strongest on the bike. Mm -hmm. And so that was some background knowledge. And then my journalism world and my cycling world collided in 2006 <laughs> when I, I had been freelancing for ESPN. Just small stories, minor stuff. And they came to me with a project that was completely life changing. And this is in 2006. They said, all right, we have, uh, we have an assignment for you. We'd like to see how somebody gets to the Olympics in this modern day and age. And, and I was like, oh, great. Who do you want me to interview? And they were like, oh, no, we want you to be the guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, want of events. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, we want you to try to get to the Olympics. Yeah. You know? And I was like, well, in what sport? What? You know, coming at it from that angle, I'm like, how, why, what? And they're like, oh, just, just you know, anything. Just go, try. <laughs> Wait a minute, back up. So you were like any right. sport? So so you did more than just triathlon and cycling at this point? Oh, at that point, um, it was the first way that I, I got into that was I thought, okay, well, let me try some of these quote unquote fringe sports that we have. <laughs> like Maybe curling? Or <laughs> what sports don't we know about in the U.S.? Maybe there's a way that we can... Um, you know, we can adapt to this, or I can adapt to this. When I say we, I think that's like the voices in my head. <laughs> you know, let's see what we can do. Um, and I did try a bunch of sports that might be fringe in America, but they are not fringe in around the world, like modern pentathlon, um, open water swimming. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, amazing things. Um, team handball, like all of these sports which we don't necessarily know about here, but you know, women are making six figure salaries Oops. in other countries playing these sports. So, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Um, after none of those sports panned out for my ability, I said, okay, stop, stop, stop. You gotta do something that you know how to do. And that's where I was like, well, you know what? I'm strongest at cycling. Also at that time I was a triathlete, but I did Ironman and half Ironman stuff. And that's not an Olympic event. You know, the Olympic distance and triathlon is very fast. And mm -hmm. I didn't have that mm -hmm. uh, skill set of, of speed. And I knew I wasn't going to drop like four minutes off a 10K in 18 months, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but, but cycling, I was really intrigued by. I was like, I know how to ride a bike and I'm strong. I don't know anything about road cycling, but maybe, maybe there is a way to, you know, to get into this. Um, and so that's the, the track that I chose. And I will. I won't give you the entire story of, of that adventure. It's actually. <laughs> this is funny. I actually have this here because I'm sending this out to a friend. But that's now a book. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So if we want the end of that story, we need to read the book. <laughs> exactly. But I can say this. I will say this. That um, 
when that assignment ended, I'll, I'll let it be a mystery whether or not I got to the Olympics. Dun, dun, dun. But, um, when the assignment ended, I was so hooked by road cycling. Mm -hmm. I was in love with the sport and I was like, oh, you know, I, I, I want to be part of this amazing pro peloton. I'm so inspired by the women that I raced against. Maybe I can get to that professional level and maybe I can make this mm -hmm. you know, the next step in my journey. And um, I, so I decided, you know, after the assignment was finished that I was going to go for this, not as a journalist, but just as a human being. I love mm -hmm. the sport. Thing. I also noticed during that journey, you know, especially coming from a triathlon background, how incredibly flawed um, women's cycling was uh, in the set, not this, not the athletes, they're great, you know, and the racing was fantastic, but the structure, you know, how come we didn't get to go the same races as the men? How mm -hmm. come if we did get to go, our races were shorter, or we didn't have the same prize money? Mm -hmm. None of that was a factor in triathlon. You raced, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, this same day, the same prize money. So, you know, switching gears into, I was like, what is this? I don't understand. Yeah, no, exactly. I, um, I used to do triathlons and, uh, it, uh, well, I suppose for junior years in cycling, it's the same events for, uh, boys and girls. Um, but for in, in my training group, group in my club, that there, there was, everybody did the same thing. And, um, I got to cycling and yeah, it, it was a, a, a bit different. The, the numbers, that's what I found really surprising. And yes. it is very, it, it does, it does speak uh, for itself. The numbers of races is just incredibly low for the women compared to the men. Mm. I've races where there are two of us on the start line. It, <laughs> It's barely a race, <laughs> um, no. but yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, sorry, I, please. This, I want this to be a discussion and yeah. boy, yeah. my get so, chatty. <laughs> <laughs> we always, yeah, for everybody, we always do like call this a Q and A, but I think most of our little podcasts have kind of just become discussions. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, we love to just take questions. So if anyone mm -hmm. has questions that's watching, you can like click the little question box and type in something so I can yeah. look at it later and I'll just pull it up and kind of bring up the questions as they become relevant. But I think a conversation just works the best, yeah. so. It's so much better. I love conversation. Yeah. And that's actually where I was going. That's, so that's kind of what got me into the, mm. the cycling world and what <laughs> the dial for me into the activism side, trying to answer those questions of why is it like this? It can be so much better. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, so you have had a big role uh, in creating le, the course by the tour um, yes. and i i had no idea about that because i knew about that race um i had watched it and and when i found out you you were heavily involved in it and um i think you were actually the one who brought up the idea is that correct yes yeah, so when i found out about that i was like wow i'm going to talk to the person <laughs> um <laughs> So, uh, yeah, how did you start um, thinking about that? And what was the process that you had to go through? Yeah, so, um, yes, the, the process of it was, at first, I started reaching out to ASO. And mm -hmm. this was back in 2009, when I, you know, was still so new. I really started road cycling in 2007. Mm -hmm. So, 2009... Um, you know, I, I was very much a newbie. I was not pro. I didn't get a pro contract till 2012. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew from that story, I just told you like that we need to have women at the, at the top, at the pinnacle of the sport. And for just about the entire world, the Tour de France is that pinnacle. Mm -hmm. So not see women there was crazy. So, you know, I, I started reaching out to ASO um, by email Saying, listen, I would like to work with you. I think we can create something pretty amazing here. I've got a business proposal. I've got a business plan. And, you know, like I had a 20 page proposal. And I was like, I'd love to sit down, schedule a meeting, sit down, talk to you. I'll fly to France if I have to, whatever it takes, right? Total silence, mm -hmm. just crickets, you know? And when you look at that big picture, it's like, okay, <laughs> there's this newbie cyclist in Tucson reaching out to Paris to, you know, if they can if they'll listen to her you know oh and 
I kept trying because that's what I do. I'm a professional trier <laughs> and I kept trying and, you know, I, I got nowhere with it. And I thought to myself, okay, okay, maybe if I can get a pro contract in cycling and maybe if I can get hired again by ESPN, um, flashback there back in 2008, our economy tanked mm. and for a while, ESPN stopped hiring freelancers, et cetera, right? So at that point, I was working in every possible job to make ends meet and pursue cycling. So, you know, I'm waitressing, I'm teaching adjunct at Pima Community College. And, you know, and in my spare time, I'm um, just, you know, emailing ASO. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, so, but it wasn't going anywhere. And those are my goals. Okay, you know, reestablish myself in mainstream journalism and get a pro contract. And maybe then they'll listen to me. <laughs> well, flash, you know, flash forward from there, um, 2012, I did get a pro contract and ASO still did not listen to me. <laughs> you know, uh, and then I, I, that's when I segued into saying, okay, maybe ESPN will um, the, will entertain the idea of doing a documentary because at that point their 30 for 30 documentary series was just up and running and it was thriving and I was like oh you barely have any female athletes um, you know exposed or not exposed but you don't have any women in your series like let's change that and I have this behind the scenes look at pro cycling now we have a possible you know amazing opportunity here and ESPN shut that down too. They said, nobody's going to watch a film on women's cycling. Mm -hmm. And I saw it, I said, whoa, <laughs> you know, how do you know? You don't know that. And I got so angry that I, you know, I left and stepped away from ESPN and said, I will make this film myself, which is kind of a big thing to say when you've never made a film. <laughs> 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 and you say it out loud and uh, you hold yourself accountable to that. So, um, at that point, yeah, I did start the process of making the film Half the Road. And um, where that ties into the, to the Tour de France and, and how it all came together for making that happen was as I interviewed all of the incredible women in the sport, like Mariana Voss and Emma Pooley and all of the likes, and those two athletes were of my generation, but also of your generation, because Voss is still out there killing it. She's great, right? And, Every time I interviewed a woman, I would say, hey, um, if there were a Tour de France, would you want to ride it? Every single woman, woman except maybe a couple track cyclists, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, yeah, of course I want to race the Tour de France. Yeah. You know, and the track cy cyclists were like, no, thanks, but go ahead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll watch it, definitely. Right, exactly. <laughs> no. <laughs> but... Um, what I then gleaned from that experience of making the film in that process, I was like, I'm not the only one who wants this. Mm. And there's strength in numbers. ASO is not listening to me, but they are listening to Marianne Vos, to Emma Pooley. Mm. And I was also lucky enough to be friends with, and still am, with Chrissy Wellington, who is four-time Ironman world champion, right? So now, and that was also, she had just retired from the sport. So she was still very much in the public eye. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I asked Emma and Marianne and Chrissy if they would form a group with me and then together we would put the pressure on ASO. Mm -hmm. And that's when the magic started happening. Um, because ASO first said nothing, you know, we tried emailing again mm -hmm. and then we said, you know what, if they're not responding to email, we need to get to a bigger platform and we need to launch a petition mm -hmm. to make this happen. And um, so that's what we did. In July of 2013, we launched a petition, but I should also say, it's not just a petition saying like, hey, ASO, let women in. We knew that the only way that it would happen is if we asked for a meeting to sit down with them and also be part of the planning process. So rather than drop it in their lap and say, make a tour de France. Yeah. Like, no, we want yeah. to work with you, right? Like, we know what the Peloton wants, what it needs, how to do it. So let's make this a collaborative effort. And that, you know, came with a website and meetings. Oh my God, like, you know, the meetings, everything that happened behind the scenes just to, to yeah. push that forward. That's a book I'm working on now. And I, you know, I'm hoping that that will be out next year, but 
let's just say it's a long, long story <laughs> for you here on this call. So you can ask more questions, <laughs> but what happened was a really good thing. And that in that strength in numbers, we launched a petition in 2013 and, um, we had almost a hundred thousand people sign the petition wow. and that is a huge number. And it was even yeah. more <laughs> back in 2013, you have to sign in to change.org. Um, you know, it, it was a more laborious process than it is now where you can just say click, you know, yeah. back then it was like, it was effort to sign mm -hmm. a petition. And we were one of their three most successful petitions. Wow. Here, you know, to have that many international people. And I had access to all the stats. And what gave me such joy was seeing that this um, desire to, to want women to race in the Tour de France, we had an equal number of women and men signing that, that petition. Amazing. Right? And that's um, important. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if, I suppose that wasn't in the stats. I wonder if um, it was only cyclists who signed it or if there were just um, civilians. <laughs> oh. oh, no, civilians. Like the the majority of the people who signed the petition were fans of cycling and fans of sport. Wow! But the biggest, um, or the I guess the when people signed, they could comment, and we got a, a lot from the tribe of dads of daughters, right? Mm -hmm. Moms, but the amount of men who would write in and say like, "Well, my daughter is is an athlete, or my I want my daughter to have equal opportunity mm -hmm. in whatever." does in life mm. you know and i think the biggest thing were the amount of people who weren't cycling fans weren't even sports fans but they got behind that idea mm. of well yeah of course there should be women at the mm. tour de france most people thought there already were yeah well i, I suppose wow. if you don't know the event you can just you can just guess that but it is like so the tour de france is the third biggest a sporting event in the world and it's only raced by men well apart from the one day race the second is the second biggest event in the world sporting event in the world is uh the football world, fifa world cup uh, okay only men also yeah. well there is the women's uh every four years too uh but that one's not counted it's the men's fifa world cup that is the second biggest. And then the first is the Olympics, which, well, that um, includes men and women. But it okay. is um, it does say a lot about the sporting situation and the whole world situation that two of the biggest sporting events in the world is um, exclusively uh, played and raised by men. It does. And I, I love that you brought up, I'm trying to get out of the sun thing. Oh, here. we had that problem um, last week. <laughs> yeah. I know. Hang on. We're moving around. So now we can see the we whole can get to your house. <laughs> There's my very empty pantry. Oh. <laughs> like, I tried, I'm trying to do that thing where you just shop every, um, you know, as little as possible, right? So I pretty much try to get, eat everything. And then there's basically like, Pop tarts and peanut butter left. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fix this. So, very, very good. Okay. Sorry. So, um, no, back to what you're saying with the Olympics. Mm -hmm. We've used the Olympics as that message saying, like, look, can you imagine in this modern day and age if we didn't have women at the Olympics? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. That wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But no brainer. Yeah. And so we try to lobby that all the time in cycling. Like, yeah, of course we need women at the Tour de France. Sometimes we get a lot of pushback, like, oh, start your own Tour de France, or you don't need women there. You can do your own. And it, it's a noble thought, but it still doesn't, um, it doesn't solve the problem of not being included equally, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also has so many other factors to that, for example, like, um, Finally, our big success with getting La Course off the ground is that it is La Course by Tour de France. And back in the late 80s, um, they, Tour de France did not allow for um, the name to be used, for the name Tour de France mm -hmm. to be used. Because a bunch of people said, fine, we will go start our own Tour de France. And they said, no, you won't. We're not allowed to have a name, right? Mm -hmm. So 
that's just one other one other area where it's, there's so many things that were happening behind the scenes with ASO not allowing women to race and not giving them equal access or opportunity mm -hmm. and wanted to start their own we couldn't even do that so mm -hmm. it was a big victory <laughs> yeah. yeah I do yeah. think that's like an interesting that's an interesting argument because I mean, when you're dealing with, you know, especially like in the United States, you're dealing with like government body, like government bodies to like, you know, as far as like USAC and things like that. And like FIFA and like USA Cycling or USA Soccer have their own, you know, issues with that with like the men's and women's side and equality. And um, I, I think most sports have that, though, where it's, it's like you have a, a competition or something and then they piggyback off each other. So it doubles the marketing value because you have men and women competing. Um, but then there are some sports that don't have that. Um, and cycling is sort of on the cusp of one of those. We don't really know. Because, like, I think what um, the Colorado Classic did was really cool. And there, there's, like, we don't need to have a women's tour of Utah or a women's, like, it doesn't need to say women's version of what already exists. Yeah. It's, right. we're just going to, we're not going to wait on a governing body or someone to, like, allow us to come in. We're just going to do our own thing. And people are going to watch it because they're going to want to watch it. And I think it turned out really good. And yeah, and, the and that's, classic was amazing to watch. Yeah, yeah it was really enjoyable. Making, so, yeah. You know, making sure that there's equal coverage or a way to watch what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. obviously so important, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So yes, Colorado Classic, they nailed it. And I was fortunate to be there in person. Well, as a racer in 2015, when it was part of US Pro Challenge. But this past year, I went back to see the race and speak. and. They nailed it. They really knocked it out of the park in terms mm -hmm. of the whole, um, the the financial side, you know, the investment that came into that race, and then the visibility of having the the coverage be live streamed. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so expensive. Yeah. And they were able to do that, and they did a great job. Um, you know, how great if someday we can see it on uh, mainstream network TV? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> things are changing, so that's not a necessity anymore. But what is a necessity is having the um, the equal opportunity to see the race yeah. as they for men, you know, as well. So same thing. I, you know, I definitely think a women's Tour de France held in at, at a different time of the year. It doesn't necessarily need to, quote unquote, piggyback off the men, but the same resources need to be available, um, you know, so the same routes and the same media exposure. That's the biggest draw. And I think one of the best things about having it at the same time in the same day is that the fans love it too, because you would actually get two Pelotons roll by. Mm. Yeah. One. And mm. for the amazing women that were part of the race that happened in the eighties, they all felt the same way. Like, you know, all these people hike up into the Alps and camp out to see mm. the tortoise roll by. And we know this, even for our great local races, people are out there cheering yeah. for and as a fan, wouldn't you rather see two races go by than, you know, one stream and then just nothing? You yeah, know? especially as it just zooms by. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you wait four hours there, you get some candy from the caravan, <laughs> <laughs> and then the peloton rolls by in 10 yep. seconds. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think it's an interesting um, thing because when you talk about doing two different races or say you did like the women's Tour de France um, at a different time, then your feet, like your car, it's like one of the biggest races to put on. Like, I mean, it's so expensive. Yeah. And the big question, like if when they get an email from somebody they don't know from Tucson, and they're like, we think there should be a women's version. They're like, okay, show us the money <laughs> and we'll think oh. about it. But like for them, you know, to put on a whole nother event, I mean, that's like, that's a, that's a huge step. But to have them on the same day, then yeah. the costs of putting on a second race are not that much more. Correct. And you so. that's really important to note because um, not only would it be more cost effective, because now what we're talking about it are two to three extra hours of road closure. Mm -hmm. at the, you know, it. Yeah. Women in a staggered start, but two to three extra hours of road closure and or the um, obviously the police, the, the medics, everything that goes along with racing, you need that too it's a hell of a lot cheaper to pay for a few extra hours of that than to recreate the entire. Yeah. yeah. That. But we're very eco-minded these days and it's a lot, it's, it's so much more ecological friendly, you know, for the race to happen all on one day than to have it happen again mm. uh, with all of everything, transit, pollution, et cetera. So it just totally makes sense. Let's do it at the same time, you know, for all.
factors, but <laughs> the Tour de France, even to this day, and I'm sure that you'll see this a little bit on, um, oh, that didn't work. Hold on. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll see this too. The, Christian Prudhomme, who is the race director of the Tour de France, he will say, oh, no, no, it just cannot be on the same day. It's impossible. It's impossible. And we all laugh at this because anybody who studied the history of the race knows that that it is possible. That's how it happened in the 80s. And the races were shortened. Uh, they shortened the women's race so that both Pelotons could successively, you know, be doing their thing on the same day. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we could easily, easily shorten stages to make that happen. That's not a big deal. But when they're saying, oh, it's impossible, what's really happening behind the scenes is um, that they are worried about cutting out the exposure of uh, the visibility of sponsors. So mm -hmm. if you've ever seen a Tour de France stage, um, you know that the, the caravan goes through and it's uh, car after car of, um, you know, the tossing the candy yeah. in the crowds. But, you know, just this rolling parade, let's just call it a giant parade. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. The music, the, yeah. And it, it's so. incredible. It goes on forever. It, we, um, I, I'm from France, so I've seen it yeah. several times. And it, every time it blows my mind, it goes on forever. I think, like, when is it going to end? And <laughs> key rings and, and it. I went. <laughs> Here. It was my first time going. <laughs> it was it was the same. It was like, oh my god, I can't believe they're throwing things at us yeah. at forty five miles an hour. No. So if they shorten that just a little bit, there's <laughs> and yeah. time for women's race. But you know, they're just uh, building that into their package of oh, you'll get so much exposure, you know, to their mm -hmm. potential sponsors. Yeah, that they're totally forgetting that they'll actually get better exposure if they allow the women to race too. <laughs> <laughs> no good time everything mm -hmm. but we are dealing with um we are dealing with traditionalists yeah. that uh it takes a lot of pressure to you know to move the dial forward a little bit and we're still working still doing it um and you know we will at some point have that tour de france it, it's taking a sweet time but we are still still fighting for it and um you know i've had to learn to it adapt a sense of humor with this otherwise i would spontaneously combust <laughs> yeah yeah I, I understand it's just like it must be really frustrating um yeah you know the frustrating part for me is sometimes um when uh, this and i'm a sensitive person too so this just gets to me when some people will say like oh la course you know it's it's just one day and it just doesn't matter or it, you know and I get what they're going for, that we all want to see multiple stages, but it, it has always been um, personal and hurtful when people don't realize how much we had to do to get that one day to even yeah. exist. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that success comes in steps. And without this step, we wouldn't be even at the place where we're discussing, you know, a Tour de France potentially um, in a couple of years. So, for me, I, I always kind of get my feathers a little bit ruffled with that. Not like I need any credit. It's not about me. It, it's about the whole thing. The work like that's that. been put into it, yeah. And um, it's like any um, any event or any, yeah, petition or uh, so much goes into it. And people only see the end product. And right. yeah, like La Course, uh, people will only see that and say, oh, they just decided to add a women's race. But it, it's a shame that uh, we don't know the whole process and the whole, all the effort that's been put into it. Oh, you will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, I'll not. read the book once it comes out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it got to that point where I was like, I think I need to, to talk about the process, mm -hmm. um, you know, a little bit on the personal side, but more so like if we are actually going to stand up and fight for change in any realm, you know, not just bike racing, but anything that we feel passionate about. If we're going to stand up and fight for change, I think we need to talk about how to do it yeah. right. And then also what happens on the professional and the personal side. Mm -hmm. Because if I sat here and said, oh, yeah, I fought for a Tour de France and it was awesome. That would be yeah. a lot. <laughs> and I, I imagine that's also a way for you to 
give back some of the experience that you've gained to other people who'd want to um, fight for causes too. Like if tomorrow we wanted to, I don't know, um, uh, uh, plant loads of trees in Tucson um, or something yeah. like that, then it would be hard to start and maybe having some knowledge from someone like you who've, who's a... I love for people to learn from my mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you know? it was, yeah, it is a learning process. And, it is. Yeah. It's a huge learning process. And there were a lot of things that, um, that we did right. And there were other things where if I had, if I did the same journey over again, I would now have so much more knowledge. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, definitely do that. Don't do that, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But for anybody who's listening or watching, if you do feel that call to activism, I will say this. There is strength in numbers. Don't try to do something alone. Um, the, the petition, the Tour de France, all of it would not have happened if I had not formed a group of like-minded people that were on the same level of wanting to push for change. And I also think this is important. You know, um, Marianne Vos, uh, Chrissy Wellington, Emma Pooley, they are all world or Olympic champions, and I am not. <laughs> but what I brought to the table was the organizational aspect and all of that behind the scenes work, you know, the, the amounts of crafts and all that we did behind the scenes and, and orchestrating the change and the platform, you know, that was my talent. That's what I was good at doing. And um, we were all able to, you know, to, to move forward because everybody played an equal part. Mm. So I think that's important. And, uh, you know, I want people to know that, yeah, yeah, you know what? We've got La Course by Tour de France um, because of some chick in Tucson, you know, who started harassing ASO by email. If anything, yeah, I hope that serves in as, a, as an example that we can all create change. Like I was saying, I was a waitress and I was teaching adjunct and I was barely scraping by. So if I was able to make any of that happen, then we all can do something. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing to hear. Um, yeah, so was it two, yeah, it was two weeks ago we spoke to Nicola Cranmer. And uh, so she's, um, I'm putting, I'm uh, putting her in parallel to uh, your story because mm -hmm. what you're doing for women cycling is trying to create a race. So you're trying to, um, make women's cycling better from the top like create a uh, an equal opportunity for pro riders yeah. for uh girls who are looking for a new sport to say oh yeah that, that looks cool they're racing and uh, yeah i want to do that too but what um nicola is doing is uh creating opportunity for young riders on team 2020 we've got a junior team so yeah. um I think that's really important to have both because you can't say, oh yeah, we need the pro uh, racing to be equal uh, to men's um, and then that will inspire young riders. No, it's, it's not a, the chicken or the egg. It's like, we need both. We do. Mm. That you'll all hear the opposition come into play. So um, if you're trying to change things at the top, you'll have people say, oh no, no, you have to change at the grassroots. And if you're trying to change at the grassroots, yeah. they'll be like, oh, no, no, you have to change it up here. Yeah. And what it takes is all of us yeah. doing no, exactly. part. those things happen simultaneously. Yeah. It's so important. Um, I think Nicholas, oh, hold on one second. My <laughs> phone is being loud. Um, one second. <laughs> okay. So it's so important that everybody's doing their part, right? And mm -hmm. one of the about Team 2020 is that it represents something that we actually need a lot more of in cycling. Yes, it's a UCI professional level team, but it's not a world tour team. And it's like, it's on the second tier. Mm -hmm. We need the second tier. If we don't have a, a, a really strong minor league, we're not gonna have a very good major league, right? Mm -hmm. And vice versa. And then beneath the minor league, you've got the, the up and coming junior riders and athletes. All three of those tiers need to be um, equally valued. Because yeah. if, if we don't have that, then how does the system, you know, keep moving forward? So I think it's it's so important, and it's a difficult thing because you know in sports, 
there's a lot of ego. <laughs> so yeah. everybody be like the best, the world tour team, the Tour de France team. I'm like, but those riders don't just magically appear there. Mm. They the system need everything. Yeah, El no, it's uh, impossible through the Tour de France and everybody pulling their pooling their energy where they feel called to make that happen for all of us to value all of those levels. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you play definitely play a role in that too with the Homestretch Foundation. Um, I think that's how that's how I first heard about you actually, because I've known a lot of different people that have stayed at the home stretch. So I made a lot of good friends there. So I oh, actually that's... like I learned about you through that. And then I found out about all the other stuff, actually, which is what you're more famous for. Yay. <laughs> that gives me joy. Um, I'm glad that the home stretch is it's up and running. Um, I can talk a little bit about that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. So as, as we say, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And for me, that rang true when I was at the world tour level. Uh, and, you know, I retired in 2017. So 2016 was my last year of racing professionally. I raced for, for five years. I was on world tour teams. And only one of those five years was I paid above the poverty line, right? <laughs> I made uh, $25,000 and I swear it felt like there were three extra zeros on the end of that. Like that, you know, that was like the biggest contract ever. And, but it also meant that I needed another job, part-time jobs to, to make it work. Right. So that, that was huge. One second. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I had something turned on and I had to turn it off. Okay. So you baking bread. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, I'm back. So, um, so I always thought to myself, and then also I think it's important for me to add the other side of how home stretch came to be. Um, so yeah, I was struggling financially to make it as a cyclist and there was no base salary in the sport at that time either. Um, and I went through a pretty devastating divorce a few years back. So trying to scrape by, you know, on, on this salary and then that salary would disappear and, and a lesser salary would come in. It was just a very unstable world in professional cycling at the world level. And I remember thinking when I was going through the hard stuff, I was like, you know what, if I, if I had a guaranteed base salary like the men have, I wouldn't constantly um, be wondering if I'm going to be okay from month to month or year to year. And at that point, I was like, I'm going to have to quit this sport. I'm not going to be able to survive. And that's the worst reason to quit something because you can't financially make it. Like you're, you're physically talented enough to do it, but you have to quit because you can't mm -hmm. make it work. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, had I been a guy, that wouldn't have been an issue because they had a salary that was at least enough to, to make a living off of. Mm -hmm. And I said, what, somebody's got to change this. And wouldn't it be amazing? Well, we're trying to change this rule. If there were a place where women pro cyclists could actually go and train and not have to pay rent and, and not have to pay utilities and just have a helping hand in get by, getting by as they're racing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in the back of my head, I kind of filed that away as something that I wanted to work on. What if there were a place where we could make that happen and fight for change behind the scenes? Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I was able to get the, uh, the home stretch off the ground because I had an investor ask me, what are you working on these days? You know, I followed your journey in pro cycling and I followed your activism journey and what are you working on? And I pitched the home stretch and he said, good, let's make that happen because I have a son and I want them to have different salaries or unequal opportunity. And so that's how it came to be, you know, that, uh, that somebody who was wow. a fan of stood behind this mission and made it possible so we got that off the ground in um well i worked on that during my last year of racing and then we officially opened in um december of 2017 oh, and so it's quite recent then quite recent this is yeah. technically fourth season yeah. but i like to say our fifth year because 2016 it was all that behind the scenes work of launching a nonprofit and getting it off the ground all the nitty the nitty gritty yeah. have fun <laughs> but uh, we we are just about to end our fourth season, um, and we have had sixty athletes, six zero, 
five, 53 women and seven men come through our program from um, 16 different countries. Wow. And it, make, it gives me so much joy. During that time, you know, we always cater first to the pro athletes at the World Tour and UCI mm -hmm. level, but we also want to focus on those uh, athletes who are in that second tier trying to make it to the, you know, the pro ranks. Um, and in, our, in that time, we've had four rising elite athletes sign their first pro contract wow. you know, with so much joy. Like, maybe we a little bit you know <laughs> yeah so does it feel like a family um like with people who come in because i'm i'm guessing if uh well maybe some of them get a, a job on the side of uh, oh just about all of them have that part-time job on the side in some capacity or perhaps they're funded we've had some younger athletes that might still be funded by uh family or parents um but to, yeah, to summarize that side of it, just about every, all of the women have a second job. The average age here is 27. So we've got the young 20s and we've got the over 30s that are all in the same peloton. Mm -hmm. And um, we do, we have, you know, the, the foundation, which is here in Tucson, we're on the Northeast side, not far from Mount Lemmon. Um, and it does feel like a family. And I always like to tell people that um, by no means is it a sorority house or a youth hostel. You know, I, I live in the guest house next door. I've got my own life, you know, so it's not like I'm hovering around watching people, you know, but either myself or um, in the past we've had, I've hired managers to be that on-call person for guidance mm -hmm. or anytime something goes wrong or they need help. Of course, it's great to have somebody there. Um, but, you know, we have to remember too that, these are adult women and they they don't need um a supervisor right mm. yeah <laughs> yeah it, it, we've got, so in the main house it's one main house and two guest houses and in the main house and the second guest house um we can sleep anywhere from six to nine people um at the home stretch depending on uh if they um have it's either two roommates or um, a solo room on occasion um, we've had athletes who are couples stay with us, and mm -hmm. it's all worked out, um, you know, and people can apply online uh, through our application system, and then we do interviews, and we try to get a pretty good feeling for whether somebody's going to thrive in a group environment, mm -hmm. you know, as an adult. Yeah. So far, you know, I have to say it's been pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, out of 60 athletes, we might have had one or two Big personalities. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're gonna have some. <laughs> you're gonna, and that's a great life skill to know how to manage big personalities. <laughs> but I think those are pretty tremendous odds that you know the the people who have come through our program um, really leave as as friends, almost in a familial setting, um, or at the very least, you know, they have utmost respect for one another. Mm -hmm. um, and the big thing too is the change of you know the salary, the base salary with the uh, UCI went into effect this year, again from the constant emailing and pressuring and <laughs> them. Wow. So they're really tired of me now. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. So is that a base salary for on the women's side? You mean yeah? So, or, or there is yeah. one or? Yeah, so this is exciting that finally UCI has, <laughs> you know, they've only been around 120 years, so they finally got the message that, yeah, let's invest properly in women. Um, so the base salary starts, but it's taking three years to build to full equity. So, for example, um, the men's base salary at the World Tour is, is around high 40 to 50K. Um, and the women, like the first year... Um, Sorry, I should also say that there's also a pro continental one that's closer to thirty five thousand, mm -hmm. and so they're trying to match the women with at least the pro, which mm -hmm. is the minor tier of the men's tiers um, in pro racing. And um, they're starting at fifteen this year, and then it goes up to twenty five, and then it goes higher than that third year. So I think it's great that that uh, ASO, sorry, UCI has said, "Yep, we're doing a base salary," and I think yeah. it's a little. Well, they're taking three years to build it <laughs> yeah too much equality all at once <laughs> well i suppose it does make sense because the team sponsors might not be able to double what they give or um 
yeah it, they might say oh no we can't give that much we're leaving you um so oh absolutely you, yeah. you make a great point and it is that's why um i kind of laugh when i say it like it's it's a starting point and yeah. that's going to be a lot of teams and right now there are eight world tour teams that have initiated that salary because you have to have that salary to get that classification right so, okay so and i i do think it's helping them too um there are some you know uh older more traditional thinking um people who will say oh well you know having a having a base salary it'll it'll sink women's cycling it'll just you know it'll destroy the sport and we have to laugh at that a little bit too and say, no, that's not it. There are so many companies and investors out there who want to invest in equality and, you know, a level field. And I, I'm proof of that. I mean, the stats I was telling you about with people who signed the petition, people who backed the film, people who invested in Homestretch, they're all doing it because of investing in women equally. So a lot of these older um, mentalities of saying, oh, no, no, we'll never find, mm. you know, like, oh, no, you will. You need to bring it out and actually yeah. go to where the investors are rather than keep on repeating yeah. in the cycling industry. Yeah, and I suppose it, at the moment, it looks good for companies to say, oh, yeah, we're investing for women to be equal. To it, does. Yeah. it does. It, it does. Yeah. Well, the other side of that, too, is like, what a lot of people don't realize is like 70 80 to 80 percent of the purchasing in decisions in the united states are made by women so when you're a company trying like the whole like, so if you think about money where does money in any professional sport come from the tour de france it partially comes from the cities paying the tour de france in order to host races in their in their location but right. like, for the majority of it it's private sponsors that want attention to them and <laughs> when you're missing out on like 70, 80 percent of the purchasing decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like it's kind of silly. So yeah. it is. It is. It's so silly that they're really ignoring the 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 math and the infrastructure. And look, I majored in English and creative writing. I did not take economics. So if I can figure out that equation, yeah. I'm pretty sure everybody can or should. You well, know. <laughs> I guess the count. So to play devil's advocate, the counter argument to that is. That well, I mean, I guess particularly in the United States, the you know teams are constantly folding. It's really hard to maintain sponsors for more than a year or two before you're com making a complete flop in your team. Um, the overall, like you know, the amateur participation, things like that, are declining, and so it almost feels like the whole sport, particularly road cycling, is taking this downhill, downward spiral. And so to try to like create equality a lot of people it, they almost think it's like a like a side thing like we got to worry about that later because we got to just get cycling back on track at the moment like we can't even like yeah. races are caught like we don't have tbc anymore you know like no leaders i mean that was that wasn't even a money issue that was just like people stepping up to run a race yeah. so it's like yeah there's you know we can't even argue about women's uh making having equal payouts at tbc because it doesn't exist anymore <laughs> you know what i mean like tour of california it's folding it's like what is there, there's you know what i mean like mm. what's the primary issue here and then some people i think point towards that but. well i agree to be they, fair, of california is a men's race so they've had women haven't they i think tour of california is women's oh. racing as well Oops. oh i'm familiar with it <laughs> with the tour of california um yeah yeah i gave you the short story there but i agree with your point for sure that um a lot of the mentality is, oh, well, we have to get cycling back on track. You know, I'm looking at it from the angle of like, hang on a minute, that track was broken. Let's build a new track. And, yeah. you know, but the more that we invest in something that's, that's a little bit different, but delivers the end result, um, that's where we really need to focus and to realign. Because, you know, getting it back on track, that track was destroyed, you know, and mm -hmm. we can build it better. Um, Jumping to Tour of California, I got to, <laughs> I got to experience uh, an interesting thing. This um... oh, she's gone again. <laughs> yeah, we got a little lag. <laughs> oh. oh, we're back. We're back. Put the plug in. <laughs> Sorry, am I there? Yep, yeah. you're good. Go. Oh, 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 oh. You're sideways. Oh, oh, hold Wait. on. Okay, I think. Yeah. yeah. There. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. 
We have our duct tape to a to a monitor, so <laughs> don't feel bad. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay. 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 All right. Oh, and there's the light again. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, um. Wow, tour of California. Yeah. So, for many, I I raced tour of California many times, especially back when it was the one day crit. <laughs> you know, we're like, what, what is this? Um. Keep in mind, Tour of California for many years has been run and governed by ASO, right? So I knew that we were up against the same type of mentality. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to want to invest in women, or they just want to invest in women part-time, which is what they were doing with the three and then the four-day race and then back to three days, right? It should have been seven, just like the men, mm -hmm. or sometimes the men was even nine to ten days. But where I'm going with this is that um, I over and over – uh, reached out to AEG, which is the company that puts on Tour of California, and said, you guys are missing a serious opportunity here. If you invest in the women, we can rebuild this track of cycling to a much better place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no, they, they, they took steps in the opposite direction. And I felt like, okay, if Tour of California is not going to have equal days as the men and equal coverage, even for the races when they did include women for three to four days, we only saw, you know, the last five to 30 seconds of the women's race highlighted along with the men. So that sucks, right? But so there, there... This happened too, like the, the men's races here, but oh yeah, the women. Oh, she, she won. That's it. Especially with the amount of cycling fans that we have in California too. That was such a shame. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to find a way that we could take it up a notch and that's when I got involved with um, with the legislator that was putting out you know a change to the government saying we deserve equal pay for equal play um, and we actually got that bill passed AB 467 in California um, which is an interesting bill the short story being that now you know yes uh, men and women need to receive the same prize money at, at events equal pay for equal play um, and there's a small there where ASO or AEG and Tour of California could say, well, we did pay women equally, you know, and, but now there's an opportunity to press charges and to, you know, form a lawsuit because no, you only paid equally for three days, not for seven days. So you didn't pay equally, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't have the opportunity, that's not equal pay. So um, this garnered a lot of attention a few months back when this bill passed. And I think it's a very good thing because again, we're talking about how can we rebuild the structure, you know, and I'm really, really hopeful and very, very confident that Tour of California can come back, mm -hmm. but under a better model. Mm -hmm. And I think they needed a little bit of shaking up. So no, um, AB 467 didn't kill Tour of California. They were struggling behind the scenes for a while, yeah. but they were struggling. They were in the same track and in the mm -hmm. same group. Mm -hmm. And if this bill helped them get to a new track, then I think it could be really successful for everyone. And so, yeah, so I, I did not kill the tour of California as a few people. <laughs> I've seen a bunch of articles about that. So um, Instagram <laughs> limits us to an hour for these Instagram lives. and We only have a minute left. I feel terrible because I feel like we could talk for another yeah. hour or two. <laughs> so we might have to revisit you later. <laughs> but um, Cecile has the last question that we like to last, ask all of our guests um, before we get kicked off. Yeah, so I feel like you've answered it a lot uh, during our chat, but uh, what impact do you think you have or do you hope you have on the cycling community? I hope if I can leave any impact at all, it's to just lift the sport to a different place and hopefully that place is better. And my greatest hope is that someday I am completely irrelevant, that we no longer have to push for women to be considered <laughs> and people like, do you remember that lady who fought for all that stuff? Like, yeah, what was that all about? Like, everything's great now, you know? <laughs> so my, my hope is for irrelevance and that we're in a better place with this sport. Okay. Awesome. Great. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you both. I really appreciate yeah. this. This is really nice. Yeah. So